Hello, and uh, welcome to an ep another episode of the study of learning and behavior. In this particular episode, we're going to talk about Pavlovian learning of predictive relations. Okay. Now, we often talk about uh, Pavlovian conditioning involving the uh, pairing of a conditioned stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus. And uh, essentially what we're going to do today is to talk about the many different ways in which a conditioned stimulus can be paired with an unconditioned stimulus. So the pairing is not just one thing. Uh, it's kind of a summary for a whole host of uh, different possible procedures. And the reason it's worth talking about this whole host of possible procedures is that very, very subtle differences in the temporal sequencing and overlap of condition and unconditioned stimuli can make a huge difference in terms of uh, uh, what is learned, how rapidly it's learned, and what, what kind of behaviors you, you get out of the situation. So uh, if we may uh, look at the uh, first slide, this uh, list uh, gives you a name and a title or the, or the technical terms for the various ways in which uh, conditioned and unconditioned stimuli uh, can be paired. And we're going to go look at each of these uh, specifically uh, with respect to uh, the timing of the conditioned stimulus in relation to the timing of the unconditioned stimulus. And uh, that uh, temporal information for each of these procedures is provided in the next slide. So uh, let's look at the short, uh, first procedure on top. In all of these procedures, time travels from left to right, okay? And each of uh, uh, these pair of lines represents a conditioning trial. So um, on the uh, first uh, conditioning trial, uh, type of conditioning that's depicted is short delayed conditioning. And here the conditioned stimulus uh, comes on. And shortly thereafter, the unconditioned stimulus comes on. And uh, uh, these onsets are are uh, indicated by uh, the vertical displacement of the line. And uh, the conditioned stimulus stays on for a while and then goes off. And uh, then the unconditioned stimulus similarly goes off. And there's a bit of overlap um, between the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. And this by far produces the most rapid acquisition of conditioned behavior and uh, you get vigorous responding. So you, usually when people are talking about CSUS pairings, they're usually talking about the so-called short delayed procedure. Now, uh, this is in contrast uh, to, uh, let's jump down uh, to the simultaneous conditioning procedure uh, that's uh, next to the last one down there. Now, uh, if you think about it, uh, Pavlovian conditioning involves the establishment of an association. So it's an association between the CS and the US. And it, so it's, it's kind of the linkage between these two stimuli. And you might think, and, uh, and it, it's reasonable to think that to produce the strongest linkage, you should present the stimuli as close together as possible and simultaneously if possible. And that's the procedure for simultaneous conditioning. So in simultaneous conditioning, the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus occur simultaneously. And you might think this produces uh, most rapid learning, strongest evidence of learning. And if you thought that, you would be wrong. In fact, simultaneous conditioning is really problematic. It doesn't produce very vigorous conditioned behavior. And why is that? That's kind of strange. Well, uh, and this is where the concept of a predictive relationship comes in. The way to think about these various procedures is uh, on the procedures that produce the best learning are procedures in which the conditioned stimulus uh, has a strong predictive relationship with respect to the US. 
Now, oh, how can you assess these predictive relationships? Well, let's think about a, a, an actual situation, a, a situation that many of you have no doubt uh, encountered um, driving along the road, particularly in a rural uh, road, you come across a railroad crossing, right? And the railroad crossing is indicated by the cross sign and there are flashing lights if the train is about to come. And there's also uh, warning bells that, uh, that ring uh, when uh, lights flash. So they're trying to get your attention and uh, trying to get your attention so that you don't drive across the track and get hit by the train, okay? Now, under, uh, do you ordinarily, if, if, if you're driving along and the, and the uh, 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 train signal comes on, uh, do you immediately stop? <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but uh, 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 often what I see and sometimes what I do <laughs> when I come upon these uh, railroad warning signals, I kind of look quickly left and right, and if I don't see a train, I gun it and <laughs> try to get across the tracks. Well, uh, so in that, so ordinarily the railroad signals are not programmed in a way that makes the signal uh, a good predictor of the train. If the uh, uh, railroad signal was programmed according to a short delay procedure, that means that like this railroad signal start to flash and boom, two or three seconds later, the train is there. And so if you haven't stopped when the signals come on here, the train is gonna hit you. That would be a short delay procedure. And if the railroad crossings were programmed that way, you would lose a lot of people in, traffic, in uh, railroad accidents but the word would get around <laughs> that, boy, if you see those things flashing, better not cross the track because the train is going to be there right away. Now, consider a simultaneous conditioning procedure. In a simultaneous procedure, uh, the warning lights and the warning bell at a railroad crossing starts when the train is actually at the crossing. If the warning bell it comes on at the same time that you see the train, does the warning bell give, is the warning bell necessary for you to predict the train? No, you can just respond on the basis of seeing the train. So uh, on the, in a simultaneous pairing kind of situation, the condition stimulus is irrelevant. The, if what we're basically trying to uh, predict and adjust to and respond to appropriately is the unconditioned stimulus, which in this example is the train. So if the warning stimulus and the train are there at the same time, the warning stimulus is irrelevant. And that's why simultaneous conditioning typically doesn't produce very strong conditioned responses. Our conditioned responses tend to be anticip anticipatory, their reflections or of the prediction that the U.S. will occur. And in a simultaneous case, the condition stimulus doesn't provide any predictive information. It's useless. And so you don't, you come, you don't respond to it. So that's the uh, uh, simultaneous case. Let's move up in the diagram to the long delay conditioning procedure. This is in fact, uh, what is uh, typically employed at railroad crossings. The warning signal comes on and it stays on a while before the train shows up. So under these uh, circumstances, uh, is the onset of the signal indicative that you're about to see the train? Well, no, not really. The onset of the signal tells you that the train will not be there for a while. And so uh, with uh, a long delay uh, conditioning procedure, what you uh, have, uh, have, uh, see, if subjects have repeated experience with this kind of a pairing, is that the conditioned response will be 
delayed until just before the train arrived, just before the U.S. arrived. Uh, so uh, uh, in uh, the example of a railroad crossing, if you hear the warning stimulus come on, you first see the flashing light and hear the bell. That tells you the train is not going to be there for a while. And so that's why most drivers that I see, as soon as the uh, warning signal comes on, they accelerate to try to get across the track. Of course, it's not a good idea to do that. Uh, your car may malfunction, and there are examples of uh, on buses and things that get stuck on the track and uh, get hit by the train. Uh, but uh, and and you can't be sure uh, what the warning delay is. And so uh, it's best not to take a risk with that. Uh, um, but um, Pavlov actually studied both the short delay procedure and the long delay uh, conditioning procedure. He observed rapid development of conditioned salivation with the short delay procedure. The long delay procedure, the subjects initially responded when the CS came on, uh, but then the uh, salivation uh, started to occur later and later during the conditioned stimulus so that it, it occurred just before uh, the food was presented. Uh, any salivation that occurred early during the in interval was it inhibited and Pavlov called this phenomenon the inhibition of delay. And you clearly get an inhibition of delay in uh, practical situations for sure. Okay, so that's the long delay procedure. Let's move up to uh, the trace conditioning procedure. This is also a procedure that Pavlov studied, and it's uh, uh, kind of interesting here. We, uh, it's sort of like the short delay procedure. We, we start the conditioned stimulus shortly before uh, the unconditioned stimulus, but here we turn up off this, the warning stimulus uh, for a while before the U.S. is presented. Uh, so there is a gap. There is a temporal gap between the CS and the U.S. And... Uh, uh, the gap can be as little as a half a second. And having that gap in there makes a huge difference. If you have no gap, you get rapid learning, and that's kind of like a short delay procedure. You stick in a half a second gap, and all of a sudden learning slows down a great deal. And when do you suppose the subject makes the condition response? Well, what is the best predictor of the unconditioned stimulus under these circumstances? Imagine if the, uh, at a railroad crossing, the warning lights and, and bell came on and then it ended. And boom, a few seconds after that, the train comes by. Now, the best uh, predictor of the train is the end of the warning uh, stimulus. And so you actually get conditioned responses uh, during the trace interval. Uh, and uh, uh, Pavlov uh, uh, hypothesized that you're actually learning to respond to the lingering neural trace of the CS, which has been turned off. So trace conditioning uh, is, is kind of a, an interesting interesting phenomenon, and it, and it uh, actually has been the uh, subject of uh, attention uh, uh, by numerous uh, neuroscientists who are trying to understand how uh, organisms uh, make use of time and uh, uh, form associations that require bridging gaps of time. We're actually bridging a gap of time. So trace conditioning procedure is kind of complicated and rather interesting. Uh, okay, let's move down to the last procedure on this slide. In this last procedure, notice that the order 
of the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus have been reversed. And so that's why this is called backwards, <laughs> backward condition. Because the C order of the CS and US are backwards in, in the, that the unconditioned stimulus uh, comes on first and it goes off and shortly thereafter or right afterwards, the conditioned stimulus comes on and goes off. So under these circumstances, what uh, does the conditioned stimulus allow you to predict? It doesn't allow you to predict the US because the US has already happened. What the CS allows you to predict is that you're going to get an intertrial interval. Nothing is going to happen for a while until the next conditioning trial. Uh, in, uh, in this particular case, the train would come by and then the lights and warning uh, bells would come on. Under those circumstances, the light, lights and bell would tell you that the train is gone and you're not going to see it again for a while. And uh, so in a sense, uh, there, uh, the, uh, the condition stimulus signals the absence of the unconditioned stimulus. And that leads to a special kind of learning that's called inhibitory conditioning, uh, which uh, we'll talk about in uh, one of the future episodes here. So um, here are all the different ways in which uh, conditioned and unconditioned stimuli can be paired. And uh, you can see you get very different results depending on what the precise temporal sequencing is. Uh, and uh, I think this is really interesting, not just because <laughs> it uh, tells us more about circumstances under which you respond, but more importantly, if we may go to the next slide, uh, the, the real take home message uh, for uh, that, that I uh, take home, the, or the reason I think these differences in procedures are so in interesting and important is that uh, they reflect the organism's interpretation or readout of the temporal structure of the environment. Uh, events in our environment occur in time. Some things occur first and others later and others later yet and so forth. And so there's kind of a temporal sequence of things. And uh, conditioning procedures and the kind of conditioned behavior that develops uh, is a reflection of how we order events in time, okay? If uh, we order events in time far apart, then we get behavior more akin to inhibition of delay. If we order events closer together, we get behavior more akin to what pr produced by short delayed conditioning. Another uh, uh, way to think about these things is that uh, different results of various conditioning procedures uh, reflect the organism's readout of the causal structure of the environment. I mean, one of the things we're always trying to figure out is what causes what? Uh, it, what event results or is responsible for the uh, causing something else? And sometimes the cause and, and uh, uh, consequence are pretty close together. You know, you, you touch a hot stove and you burn yourself and that occurs just right away. <laughs> Other times, the causal events are pretty far apart. You know, you start boiling water on the stove and it's not going to boil for a few minutes. Uh, there's uh, You form a relationship with someone else and there are aspects of that relationship that will not be evident sometimes for months or years afterwards. Uh, my favorite one is, uh, is pregnancy. You know, uh, certain events cause... Uh, pregnancy and uh, and uh, uh, the result in the birth of a newborn. Uh, those events are nine months apart for human beings. So uh, the uh, causal uh, interpretation of what causes what and what is the causal texture of the environment requires paying attention to the order of events and the timing of those events and so forth. And I think Pavlovian conditioning uh, ref the, reflects 
how we interpret the causal structure of, uh, of the environment. Well, that's my story for today. And I hope you found it interesting. And even if you did not find it interesting, I hope you'll pay close attention to it because these temporal details make a big difference in terms of how learning proceeds. Thanks a lot and uh, have a good day.